Amen. <laughs> hey, son, come here. Come here, you start taking that up. Come up here, folks. Yes. Get ready. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings this morning, and then we'll get into the message. So everybody that can and will stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father God, I thank you, God, for this morning. I thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in your house. And God, as we go forth, I ask God that you bless this offering for the upbuilding of the kingdom, God. You know the needs that we have in the church, God. And we thank you, God, that you've always been faithful to supply those needs. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're our God, that you're our King, that you're our Lord. And with that being said, Lord, I ask humbly, God, knowing I can't bring nothing forward out of myself, God, that you would anoint me for this hour to pronounce your word to your people. And the Lord, hearts, minds, souls, and ears to receive this word, this word of repentance, this word of uplifting, and this word of righteousness. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Together at the offering. And as he comes by, if you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 2, the Gospel of John chapter 2. Starting at verse 13. And I'm going to read several scriptures to you. Out of both John and Mark. But starting off with John chapter 2 verse 13. When you get there say amen. 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 13. And would you want you boys give me a ball of water please? A cold one. Thank you. I forgot to get it myself. And let's stand for the reverence if we can for the reading of the Word of God. The Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sent and when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now go with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 15. Get there, say amen. Mark chapter 11, verse 15. Amen. 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 The Bible says, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, It is not written, My house shall be called, of, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it the den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when evening was come, he went out of the city. And you may be seen. Now let me tell you something. That same story is also found. It's recorded in all four Gospels. It's also recorded in the 21st chapter of Matthew and in the 19th chapter of Luke. But I want to bring something forth to you this morning. It's time to make the temple of God holy again. It's time to clear the way back to Jesus, back to the Holy Spirit, back to the Holy of Holies, back to righteousness once again. But I'm going to tell you something that may surprise some of you. I read this to you out of John, and I read it to you out of Mark. Now Mark, Matthew, and Luke are talking about the same event, but John's not. Jesus actually did this twice in His ministry. And where you find that at is in the John account. He did it at the beginning of his ministry. 
The other three gospel accounts say he did it at the end of his ministry, and there's a few subtle differences in how it words the two events. And what you need to understand is what this is doing is giving us a type and shadow of the first coming of Jesus and of the second coming of Jesus. Can I get an amen in the house on that? What you see is that when Jesus came into the world, He came in, and I'm going to read this again. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand. That says a mouthful. Because in the Old Testament, the Passover was the Lord's Passover. The feast days were the Lord's feast days. You need to follow me on this. But by the time Jesus came, man had so corrupted the things of God that God Himself did not even consider it His own and simply referred to them as the Feast of the Jews and as the Jews' Passover. In other words, He had disassociated Himself from their religion. But there's something else that you need to know in this particular story and in both instances when he became angry. You know, I like the joke that says when someone asks you what Jesus would do, just remember that chasing people with whips and flipping over tables is not out of the question. Amen? But Jesus became angry because the particular court... You see, now you've got to understand this. People take this story way out of context. It's not wrong to have what they were doing as far as setting up shop and selling the animals was not wrong. As a matter of fact, that was ordained by God through the Old Testament to give people a way who couldn't afford to bring their animals or couldn't afford animals. And you'll even notice, and you know there's been great debate on whether Joseph and Mary had money, but when Jesus was a baby and they made their sacrifice, the Bible says they bought two doves at the temple which signified that they were poor because the poor were the only ones allowed to make that sacrifice. But what happened was, it wasn't so much that they were there. It was the intent of their heart while they were there. Because they were cheating the people. Because they were selling sickly animals. Because they were selling things that were about half dead. And they were overcharging them when they came. But there was something else at the gate where they were. They had blocked. Now if you can imagine this money changers tables being set up and the gate was blocked and that was important church you need to hear me on this because that particular gate was the only gate that a Gentile could come in. The Gentiles had a group of people and that the Jews referred to as God seekers. Now some of our Sabbath day keeping friends will argue that throughout the New Testament that it records that the apostles went to the temple on the Sabbath, and it does. But they weren't inside. You see, during those times, you had nations, people from all nations, living around Jerusalem. Well, my goodness, it had been occupied five times at this point, or six. You had Roman citizens, you had Persians, you had Arab, you mean just from all over the known world at the time living there. And of course, some of them would hear about this God of the Jews and they would begin to seek Him. But they were not allowed to come in to the temple. They would have to stand outside the wall and the one door that was open, that they would be allowed to walk in, the money changers, the greedy ones, the self-centered ones, the self-serving ones, the ones that were there, honey, for their own agenda and didn't give a flip about nobody else, the ones who wanted to make sure that the temple was running in a way that profited them and made them happy because you see for them to be there the Pharisees got a certain cut off of what they were selling so it was lying in their pockets so they were more than happy to allow this evil to take place in the temple they were more than happy to allow the money changers there and they didn't care that these people that were seeking after God that were seeking after refuge that were seeking after help couldn't get in the door When we see our apostles in the book of Acts, 
going to the temple on the Sabbath. And they would stand outside those temple walls. And they would talk to the ones, Kelly, that the Jews had already condemned to hell. They would talk to the ones, honey, that the Jews had already decided wasn't good enough to be Jews. They would talk to the ones, Kelsey, that the red that they regarded as being dogs, the uncircumcised ones, the heathen ones, the ones that don't belong with us, the ones that can't come in and sit in the building we sit in because, well, they wear blue jeans to church and we wear nice dress clothes to church. The ones that, you know, well, they don't sing and they might want to get up in the choir, but they don't sound as good as we sound. So we really want to try to push them off. As a matter of fact, we'll stand them up and turn their mics down and we'll just project out the ones that we want to be heard. That crew. But the apostles would go and preach to them. Who wasn't there giving a sacrifice because they knew the sacrifice. They walked with it. They wasn't there to get a word because they had the word in them. They understood more about the word than all the Pharisees put together. They wasn't there for a taste of religion because they'd had religion all their life. What they were there seeking after was to continue and to be obedient in the relationship they had with the Lord and to preach his gospel. So that's why they showed up at the temple, Sean, on Saturday, was because that was the day when the people were at the temple and they could reach the most. But they still had church on Sunday, by the way. But you see this picture of the Lord coming up early in his ministry. And the Bible says in John, and we'll read this again, it says. And when he had made a scourge of small cords. Let me tell you something. The Lord was not coming to play games. You don't make a whip and start hitting people with it if you're there to play around. You don't go up and flip their tables over if you're there to play around. But you notice something? They had to be one against a hundred in this situation and he was like Bruce Lee in the middle of it. Come on. He was like Chuck Norris, flipping tables, probably running, whipping people, hitting them. Didn't say they fought him back. He cleared the way, which was exactly what should have been done. This is a shadow of what he was doing in his earthly ministry for three, ministry for three and a half years. He was clearing the way so that others could come in. And then when he leaves the earth, when he goes back to heaven, he leaves the apostles something that we refer to today, and it's even listed in most of your Bibles this way, as being the Great Commission. And he says, Go you into all the earth and preach the gospel. Go you into all nations of all kinds, of all kindreds, and tell them the good news about Jesus. Tell them the good news about me. Tell them the good news about them being able to receive the Holy Spirit. See, it wasn't go out and find some church members. The Great Commission doesn't say go out and pick and choose who you like to come in. The, wasn't, the Great Commission wasn't go ye forth and gather on together those that agree with you and your opinions match up and you can talk and gossip about the rest of them. It wasn't go ye forth and trash talk the pastor, trash talk his family, trash talk those around him. And don't forget the fact that the man spent four, five, ten, fifteen years trying to help your sorry butt Get up in the morning and get to heaven. Don't worry about that. Trash talk him when he dares disagree with you because you're all knowing. Come on. Let me define a cult. Come on. A cult is defined as being a group of people who are allegiant to one cause. A cult is defined as a group of people who will follow a cause and follow a leader of an individual 
to their death of need. A cult requires your most divine devotion to its leader. And I have been accused of being a cult. Can I tell you something if you're listening, sweetheart? Come on. I am. I am absolutely devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I will follow this person to my death if that's what it takes. And there ain't no slick talking devil going to stand on Facebook and back me down. had a dream a few weeks ago. Or no, no, I'm sorry. It was a few days ago. Some of y'all have the gift of seeing things, but you're not psychic because psychics are in the devil. But God shows you stuff. You have a great discernment. And God actually has given some of you a great gift of prophecy. And the devil's tried to scare you out of using it. But Paul said to embrace that. He said the gift of prophecy will edify the church beyond any other gift that you can have. He said if you want to desire a gift, he said tongues is awesome, but desire. If you want to pray for a gift, pray for the gift of prophecy. Amen. Now the office of prophet has been vacated, so if some fruitcake starts calling himself a prophet, you need to check out their address, okay? Yeah. Now they may be a godly person who's been misguided, into believing that it's okay to call yourself that. And that's all right because, you know, if they'll receive, if they're really a God, they'll receive the truth. But there's some people who go around naming themselves bishop and apostle and prophet and great bishop, apostle, prophet, whatever. But there's some people in here that have the gift of discernment and prophecy. And the devil has been doing his dead level best to get you to stop. But can I tell you something? That is a very special gift. And I'm going to say this boldly that I have that gift in some instances when God needs to show me something. And it always seems to happen the same way. I'll have a dream about a snake. Now anybody that knows me in the natural, you know that I'm terrified of those critters. I don't like garter snakes. I don't like black snakes. As a matter of fact, if you ever want to make any money, i got a standing bounty. Come to my place, kill all the snakes you want, and I'll give you some money for every one you kill. Amen? That might get me in trouble, but I can't. I'll tell you, I'm terrified of them. I mean, they creep me. I don't like dead ones. I don't like finding their skin. I'm, he put a rattlesnake rattle in the car in a Ziploc bag, and I like to just... Lost my, my, well, I just, you know, I lost it. I can't handle it. I don't know why God allow. I just fear them. I, they paralyze me. There's not much anything else. I'll kill a spider, a rat, whatever. You know, now bats creep me out a little bit. But, but no, if that had been a flying snake, honey, you'd have been on your own in the house at night. We had a bat get in the house. And it wasn't a little, it was big. <laughs> well, it got bigger. Hey, it was hanging on the curtains. And me and Ethan, now if you can picture this, me and Ethan and Big Austin are standing at the bedroom door debating on what we're going to do with it. And that evil creature turned its head completely around with its little red beady eyes and went, and took off after us. Anyway. But I am terrified of snakes. I just am. I can't help it. I've tried to get over it. I, I just and I've just decided it's just how it's how it is. But when God wants to show me something, He'll always show me a snake, and I'll always not be afraid. And a few days ago. I woke up and I and I just had to kind of laugh because I knew that something was coming. Because I dreamed about this huge copperhead. And it was in there, in this building, and it was trying to strike at whoever, and it was violent. And so it was with copperheads if you study on them, they don't they don't like to even inject you with those. Most most copperhead bites are not fatal. Most of them are dry. 
because they just really just want to get away from it. Because they understand if they inject their poison, they ain't going to eat again until they get some more. You understand? So it's not the creature's fault. I mean, God made them. They are what they are. But what was uncommon about this copperhead was that it was trying to strike at everyone in here. And it was coming after you with the intent of killing you. And it was huge. It was probably as long between that pole and that pole. But in the dream, I had a weapon. I don't remember what kind of weapon it really was, but I knew I had to kill it. And God, and it was like God was speaking to me in the dream saying, just take its hand. And then we have what we've had. A battle. Some of you are going through battles. The devil don't like you anyway. And that has nothing to do with this church. You just don't want you to hear the gospel. He don't want you hearing that you have to live righteously and right to get to heaven. He don't want you hearing that it's not alright to kiss a co-worker in the restaurant just because it makes you feel good. It's not alright to stand in front of a church and take a vow that you'll be an elder of the church and that you'll be a leader and a guider to the people and then sneak around behind the pastor's back and start telling people they don't need to come back anymore that we don't need you anymore, you're not welcome and we don't really like you. It's not right to take what the leader of the church says and go around to people and twist it around and turn it. See, God ain't into that. Amen. That's a snake. It's not all right to come and make up something so that you won't come back so that they can have more power and control. See, that's the evil ones blocking the gate for those who need it. And they come in. And there were righteous people who lived, but see, they're looking at this gate being blocked, and well, it come up slowly. You know, they, they started off with a table here, and maybe, you know, they were moving over a little bit. Oh, I don't really like it there, so I'll move it just a little bit more. Finally, they get the door blocked. They come in carrying, you know, luggage, baggage full of their own agenda and their own wants and needs, and they carry that in, and supposedly, you know, it's supposed to benefit people, but they start unpacking their junk. And then it begins to cost everyone around them peace of mind. It begins to cost everyone around them more than what it should. I don't mind helping anybody out with the problems. But you ain't not. There's some people, you can't help them. Because all they're going to do is look at you and talk in circles. All they're going to do is look at your eyes, look you dead in the eyes and lie about the situation. They're never going to confess. They're never going to come clean. They're never going to totally admit let me tell you something, we can endure some hurtful things. We can endure some hurtful things from one another, but where it starts is at the cross. And you try to come into it any other way than that, you're wrong. All you're doing is piling up doctrine. You're piling up garbage. You're piling up your thoughts. You're piling up your opinions. And let me tell you something, to try to wade through that is going to cost you more than it should. Because before long, those people's spirit are spiritual vampires. Because they will suck the life out of you. But I like what Jesus does. He comes at the first part of His ministry and He sees it. Let me tell you something else. He didn't just have it. You don't make a whip just to carry it around in case. He took His time and He braided together a whip of small cords. I won't let this set in. Was he angry? Yeah. He mad. Because he saw the people, Mr. David, who couldn't get in the camp. They've been seeking after God. Some of them even thought about becoming Jews. And suddenly they show up one day and then they're not welcome inside anymore. And instead of even getting to be able to get inside the gate where they're close and they can hear, because you see, they read the Word of God all the time in the temple. There's always someone sitting there reading the word out loud. So, and for many of those people, that's only that was the only way they ever got to hear the Bible. And you can picture now that for a time that they were able to come into this court and they could hear the word, and then suddenly they come and the doors locked. It's all blocked up. 
said we got our afternoon back. And we don't fit in it no more. That's basically what they were saying to him. Well, see, we want to be seen, and, and you're really you're kind of you're kind of crowding things out. And, and you know, this is our time. This is about us now. This is about the my time to shine. One of the things that Jesus condemned so much about the religious leaders was how they. Not how they dressed because they were commanded by, by the old covenant to dress the way that they did, but everything that they wore represented Christ. But, but they would put those garments on and they would polish them up. It was by their attitude because they would strut around like they had some secret knowledge or some secret vision or some secret that nobody ever else had. That they had figured out on their own. You know, Jesus would many times confront them and he would be puzzled and and he would, in a very condescending tone, would look at him and say, Don't you know who I am? You're the one, you're wearing a garment that represents... It'd be like him looking at a Christian today with a Christian t-shirt on and looking and saying, You've got my image right here and you still don't know who I am. There's Christians today who will fight you to the death. Judge not. Judge not. Only God can judge me. Judge not. They've only read two words out of the whole Bible. Yeah, exactly. They found that part that they liked and they forgot all the rest. Judge not. Judge not. Only God can judge me. Judge not. You're not supposed to judge. Judge not. Find me that in the Bible. I got a thousand dollars. Says no one can show me that. Be in context. And now it's not gambling because I ain't gonna lose. I ain't taking your money. I just want you to understand you can't show me that in the scripture. It's don't exist. We have to be able to make righteous judgments. We have to be entrusted to preach the word and to be able to look at you and see whether or not it's taking effect or not. You judge a tree by its fruit. I'm sorry, I had a friend of mine in North Carolina. We don't need fruit inspectors, Jason. Yeah, we do. We need lots of fruit inspectors. As a matter of fact, we need a whole army of fruit inspectors right now patrolling the streets because there's something called haywire. When you can sit and you can go to church and you can only the only reason that you're there is to do and do and have what makes you happy. And you can sit and go to a church and the only reason you're there is because you're going to get to do something, you're going to get to dance or do or do a ditty or whatever because it makes you happy. That's the only thing that you're involved with. You're consumed with your own righteousness, with your own happiness, with your own what you want. There's something wrong if the Holy Spirit never convicts you. Shame on the pastors. Shame on the preachers. Shame on them for creating an atmosphere where we can put up the money changers' tables in the way of those who are seeking after the truth of God's love, the truth of righteousness, who are seeking after the Jesus that can put broken homes back together. Oh, it may not be easy, but He can do it. Something wrong when we get in the way of people who are seeking after the Jesus who can put healing in their heart, who can settle a noisy mind, who can who can uplift the broken heart. Do you understand? Who can give a feeling of peace and companionship to those who feel lonely, broken, and undone. There's something wrong with our own agenda. And we see it all the time. Have different people. I remember a few weeks ago, right before we turned this room around, we had a woman who came as a visitor and did her dead level best to stand right here at this pole and try to stop what God was doing in the middle of it. Did her dead level best. And started off by saying, Well, I, I, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna, I, 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 gonna. Till I finally had to stop her because she was trying to break what God was doing. Right. It's not all right to speak up when the man or woman of God is giving the message and try to interrupt their train of thought. It's not all right. If it's of God, God's Word will keep, keep your mouth shut while the Word is being pronounced. It's not all right. It's not all right to have a poem to read every time you come to church. It's not all right to have a song to sing every time
time you come to church. If you don't believe that, check the Bible out and see what it says. It says, let two or three witness at most. Two or three at most speak in tongues. Two or three at most sing. So that everything is done in decency and order. But here's what the devil does. He gets about ten people. I went to a church one time and had to go with a, a buddy of mine who was ministering that night. Brother, we sat in that church for an hour and a half and they were still singing and God wasn't in it. Because the Spirit of God left after about the fifth song. And after about the twenty-fifth song, I was ready to leave. I got invited to go preach at a church one night. And the host pastor wouldn't shut up. I was this close to just leaving. Because the Spirit of God had left. I had nothing left in me. But out of God's mercy, He poured it back on me when it got my time. Do you understand? We are all the time in church. Because we won't listen and do what the Word of God says. We are always putting up blocks in front of people. There's people who will come to the altar who need time, who need to get something off their chest, who need to be anointed and prayed for. And what will we do? We'll rush them with about 15 people and we'll all start gabbing in their ear at the same time. Or we'll grab somebody up and get them over here in the corner talking for 20, 30 minutes while the altar call's going on. Or we'll decide that it's time to get up and go to the bathroom when the Spirit of God's moving on someone lost in the congregation. We'll decide that it's time to do anything but listen to what God's saying for the moment. To be sensitive to the Spirit of God for the moment. We'll get our carnal minds wrapped around it that we need to be number one. That our agenda needs to go forward. And we'll block up the door for someone who's desperately in their last breath of life that they've got in them trying to get a hold of God, trying to get a hold of the Word trying to get up close and personal with Jesus, we'll cut them off because we run too long. Don't do more than two altar call songs, brother, because we run too long and we're hungry. But it don't matter. Well, we'll cut the Holy Spirit off. He'll come back to them next time. We don't have to be obedient to what God says. We want what we want. Come on. And we want it now. They were mad. Because when the Lord came tearing through there, He flipped their tables over and He took away what they profited from. They were mad because He dared mess with what they had going on. And then you see Him come back again. The first time Jesus Christ came to this earth church, He came as a lion or a lamb. You see Him the next time that He goes into the temple at the end of His ministry, He goes in and does the same thing. And He flips their table over except this time. He goes one step farther and He says, You've made my Father's house a den. This is what you better get ready for, church. This is what you better get ready This is why you live right while you can. This is why when God convicts you, if you have to take the junk that's in your house, brother, and burn it in a barrel and make a public proclamation that you'd rather follow God than take a chance as to whether this is all right or not, this is the time to do it. You know them old timers, them old Pentecostal people getting ridiculed all the time. Because they wouldn't cut their hair. Because they wore dresses to a certain length. Some of them wouldn't wear a watch. They wouldn't wear a wedding band because they believed it was too vain. Now I'm going to tell you something. That might be a little out of sorts. But I would much rather hang out with that crowd than hang out over here with this loosey-goosey crowd that's trying to tell me that anything goes. I can do whatever. I can get behind the pulpit and get naked. I can get naked. We can swap spouses out. We can have homosexual affairs and still get up and call ourselves ministers. I'd much rather chance it over here with those that tell me that I need to wear my sleeves to here because they might be an heir, sister, but at least they're trying to see how close to heaven they can walk instead of trying to see how close to hell they can dance and still make it in on the other side. There's no room for that. There will not be any room for that. We don't have a dance team because I ain't chancing it. 
Right. We don't have, we don't get up and do foolishness in the sanctuary because I'm not chancing it with my soul or your soul. Because if I allow something in this house that drags you to the pit of hell, God will call me to the carpet one day and ask me to answer for it. And if you are that intent that you must misbehave, that your sin and your lifestyle means that much to you, then go on down the road, you'd be better off and you can sleep better at night because of it. Amen. You know, son, if you want to attack me and my family personally, that's fine too because you're cowards and you don't. I've not had one person yet come to me to my face and tell me anything. So that tells me those that are out there gawking now ain't nothing but cowards. They're working under a demonic, cowardly spirit. They don't have the nerves to walk in here and confront me face to face because they know they'll lose. That's right. They know they'll lose because I'll break out the Word of God. I'm not going to argue with my wisdom. I'm not going to argue with my words. I'm going to bring out the Bible, and you'll have to argue with God. But I'm not playing games with your soul. You understand? I'm not doing it. And if you want to play a game with your soul, there's the door. You're welcome to come back. But you don't need to come back till you get your heart right with Jesus. Then you come back in. But you know what? I'm glad they trash talk us. I'm glad that they try to tell people we're peeling. I'm glad they tried to tell people this, that, and the other about us, honey. Because you know what? Peter laid that out a long time ago. And this goes for you too. If they trash talking you, Peter said this. He said, count it all joy. He said, that, you know something? They tell us one time in the book of Acts, Sean, that they took all, they took the disciples outside the town. They were preaching to them God seekers again. They scourged them with whips, left them bloody, beaten, bruised, beat down, dirt all over them, their clothes tore. And you know what the Bible said about those men? It said when they got their self up off the ground, they dusted their self off. And they began to thank God. And they began to praise Jesus' name because they were found worthy to be beaten for His cause. So if the devil wants to open it up on me, I'm just going to keep praising God because I figured out I must be worthy for Him to attack. I must be worthy for Him to be worried about. I got a little old church that barely ever has 20 people in it. And the whole hell scared to death. And got all of its minions around attacking all it can like a bunch of little barking chihuahuas. Well, we want to do this. Well, we want to do this. And it ain't nothing but the devil trying to bring this thing. Amen. Well, I think. Well, I think. Well, I think. And if you say that fast enough, it sounds like yap, 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 yap. I got to go to one more place in Scripture. We got a Bible college today. We're going to kind of keep the pace slow because we got a brother and sister and they back with us yet. So I'm going to give y'all a little break. And go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to see something here now. this message, we are a cult. You all tag the appropriate people if you want to. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 says, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in the world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Okay. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise from their own craftiness. Out of all this scripture I read you, God gave me one, one sentence, one phrase to go with it. And what he had me put down was this. We are the temple of God. And we are to live in a way that doesn't excuse sin, but also doesn't exclude people from reaching Him. That's right. Yes. Amen.
We can't help someone if we don't let them through the door, folks. Right. We can't help a homosexual if we beat him down before he ever gets in a chance to hear. Amen. What we need to do is we need to keep the door open and let him come in and let him hear the Word of God. Amen. And let her come in and hear the Word of God. I can't help a drug addict if I want to get through the door. Right. Like, we need them up there and tell them you need to get cleaned up before you come in. I need them sitting right beside you, Amen. brother. I need them to get up close because if God don't draw them, I can't get them in here That's anyway. Right. And if God can't keep them, I can't keep them anyway. So whoever's here and who's not is entirely up to God and in His wisdom and His plan. But I better be doing my part because let me tell you something. I've been to the Lord's woodshed a few times, brother, and He can still make that chord, and He can still make you sing notes you never thought you could hit, but that's only because He loves you, because the Bible says that a child without correction is a bastard, and no one loves it. God corrects you because He loves you. He don't let you sleep with those things that you know aren't right. He doesn't let you get easy and comfortable in your sin. And the only way for you to do that is to get your own mind built up, your own craftiness, your own foolishness built up, and convince yourself that it's all right. And finally, God will say, fine, have it your way. That's the only way to do it. That's the only thing I'll make will make you stand up when the Holy Spirit's moving into place and trying to disrupt you, thinking you're doing right, but really you're being an agent sent by the devil. Now you want to know, people don't sign on for that. They just don't sign up for Jesus is how they end up being used by the devil. See, it ain't really people we're fighting against. It's powers and principalities in high places. And people don't join up in those ranks all automatically. But what they do is they keep some foolishness on their TV shelf that they shouldn't have. They keep some books that they read that they shouldn't have. They keep some music playing on their stereo that they shouldn't keep playing. Oh, come on, when we go all the way through the list, they, they, they keep lusting after that co-worker that they know they shouldn't be mixed up with because they tell everybody they're happily married and how wonderful things are when they stand up in front of the church and they swear an oath on the Bible and provide that they'll be an elder but yet they're snaking around with this sister and that sister in the church they're blocking the way they're blocking the way pastors it'll be you no know, good keep the one because they're donating all that money to your church. It'll do you no good to keep that one for sheep's clothing. Yeah. That little Methodist church up the road has got that devil Sunday school teacher that's had four or five affairs with different men's wives. I don't understand what the thinking is. Does he contribute a lot of money? But I know in four or five families, he's probably tore all to pieces. I know four or five individuals that may never grace the doors of the church again. Because every time they look at it, they're only thinking about a Sunday school teacher that, that they call it their wife. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an evil God. None of us are above mistakes. None of us are above reproach. But we go about living our life as if we can just continue doing whatever and God will just have to understand you just have to forgive he'll have to let me tell you something if you're saved and redeemed you don't have to worry about seeing the wrath of side of God on you but he has one when you play games with him you'll see it one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible it's my favorite because it strikes fear in me honey this comes out of the book of Amos when he tells Israel, he says, you know what, you've got to listen to me. I've said prophet, and I'm just paraphrasing, he says, I've said prophet after prophet. I've said word after word. And you still won't listen. Got down to the days of Amos with the prophets, what they must say. I mean, you know, some of you may not know this, but Amos was a sheep herd. And God would have found him and gave him a word because the prophets that supposedly he had wouldn't even receive him anymore. He told Amos, he said, tell him I'm not listening. Go down there and tell them they're praying in vain. Tell them their feast days are in vain. 
As a matter of fact, he goes a little deeper and he says, tell them I hate to feast guys. Tell them I hate to hear them pray to them. I hate to see their sacrifice when they grow. And then as a capital, I have a little statement with an exclamation point. He says, no, and tell them one more thing. Since they won't be obedient, tell them to prepare to meet their God. Yeah, about games are right. The church is a place of refuge for anyone who seeks after it. The Word of God is available to anyone who seeks after it. And it ain't about our life. It ain't about having our best life. Does God want to bless you? You better believe He does. But He expects you to bless others. Man. He's supposed to hoard it up in a $20 million mansion, Kenneth Copeland. I don't know if he missed that in scripture. He ain't supposed to charge $850 a seat to see it, old Steve. Maybe he's misguided. You're supposed to have it available so that anyone, no matter what condition they're in. I would welcome a pagan group with goat blood all over it. But I need this church to sit down and preach the gospel to me for a few months. What this whole thing about is preparing you and me and us and our children to meet God one day. Because you have an appointment, Kelsey. Ethan, you have an appointment. Tristan, you have an appointment to meet Jesus one day. You've got one too, little buddy. It's already been said. The dates, if you don't know the date, but God does. He's got a date written down. The moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, God made an appointment with you in eternity. And He made an appointment with the expectations that when He saw you, He would look at you and say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter in your rest. But He also made those appointments realizing that some of you would have to look at it and say, You're part of Let's all stand. While the brother gets something ready, I want all eyes closed and heads bowed.